Our next uh, uh, presenter comes to us uh, on Zoom from Boston, um, Dr. Wynn Schwartz. will be doing a presentation on preparation for descriptive psychology, conversations with Osorio on reading Wittgenstein. Um, and let me tell you a little bit about him. He's a clinical and research, he's a clinical psychologist and research psychoanalyst. For 40 years, he's been on the faculty of Harvard University as a lecturer in psychiatry in the medical school. Um, he also conducts a seminar and supervision at the Extension School, um, where he provides graduate case study seminars focused on the person concept and methodology of descriptive psychology. He's been a professor at William James College the Massachusetts School of Professional Psychology and Wellesley College. He has taught at the Boston Psychoanalytic Society and Institute and the Massachusetts Institute of Psychoanalysis. He is author of the 2019 Descriptive Psychology and the Person Concept and is on the editorial board of the American Journal of Psychotherapy and Professional Psychology Research and Practice. He offers individual and couple therapy and consultation in, in Boston. And I just have to say, I just admired, uh, I loved Wayne Schwartz when we were growing up in graduate school <laughs> and his um, interactions with, uh, with Peter Sorio in, in, in class. I just thought he was my hero. I just thought he was so old. <laughs> and he had all these questions and all these uh, challenges. And Pete was just great about responding to that. <laughs> Dr. Schwartz, welcome. Hey, can you hear me? How's the sound? Great. Right. Okay. Um, uh, I'm not quite going to do what it said in the uh, announcement because, um, you know, I'm contrary. Uh, and it uh, came up in the midst of this that I thought I had, uh, I'm kind of going to do what I said I was going to do. Uh, because what I'm going to want to talk about is going to end up dissolving the uh, private language debate between Chomsky and Wittgenstein uh, by means of um, descriptive psychology. But I'm going to get us back to the theme of what uh, what oriented me towards this the subject matter. Um, I, I first met Pete uh, three weeks into the fall semester of 1972. Some of us may remember that semester. It didn't start with Pete. It started with his TA in a, a personality course that was um, uh, taught without or introduced without much clarity. On the other hand, the handout that... Uh, the outline for descriptive psychology for personality theory was intriguing, felt familiar, and made sense to me. Um, three weeks in, when Pete finally arrived, I, uh, you know, I'd been wandering around the department trying to find my way, and uh, so I knocked on the door. And in our first meeting, I asked if he would offer me a tutorial. I had the very fortunate experience of, as an undergraduate at Duke, of not having any requirements at the university at all. So. I spent most of the four years in tutorials or in laboratory or in uh, individual study, occasionally taking a lecture class. I wanted to continue that tradition. So I asked Pete if he would uh, offer me a tutorial and he started by saying no, um, a comment I was quite familiar with over the years in working with him. But when he said no, I said I had been looking around the department and I told him I didn't come to Boulder to waste my intellectual time. Uh, somehow that worked. And we began weekly meetings from there for many years to come. In my second meeting with him uh, in the uh, Taste Like Chicken uh, Alfred Packer Grill, uh, at least that's how Republicans, I guess, in the mountains taste after they've been frozen and then recooked, um, I asked what I should read to understand the uh, person concept. I told him about my background in uh, personality theory, and he suggested a careful rereading of Wittgenstein. So some orientation. 
during Wittgenstein's life, he published only one book, the 1921 Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, which was his uh, became his dissertation at um, at Cambridge uh, under uh, under Russell. He died in 1953 uh, before the publication of his second volume, The Philosophical Investigation, which I'll be making some use of, at least in terms of its current uh, somewhat nicer translation. The Tractatus, the first volume, starts with the world is all that is the case. The investigations ends with in psychology, there are experimental methods and conceptual confusion. And then he more specifically says, problems and method pass one another by. We're going to find that there's something very problematic about the uh, methodologies of psychology and the behavioral sciences, especially when they're grounded in a particular sort of root metaphor of mechanism or organicism. Um, some of the various reductionistic and deterministic dilemmas that uh, plague, the sub plague the subject matter and in many ways still do. The Tractatus asserts that the world is the totality of facts, not of things, of assertions, of statements. That what is the case, a fact, is, uh, is the existence of a state of affairs. Now, some of this language, as it translates from the German into the English, becomes quite familiar in uh, the outline of descriptive psychology and in the, some of this, the language that we'll see Osorio making use of. In my readings, the prime mission of the investigations was to correct the limitations, the logical positivistic limitations of the Tractatus, and to amend and expand the concept of world and a verbal behavior. So I read, Pete tutored, and we discussed Wittgenstein. Let me read something that provided some uh, helpful orientation to me. Think about this in some ways as how our subject matter, um, descriptive psychology, gets its its ethos, gets its um, kind of uh, cultural, philosophical foundation, um, a perspective, a vantage point. 126, which we can call a maxim in, in this volume. Philosophy just puts everything before us and neither explains nor deduces anything. Since everything lies open to view, there is nothing to explain. For whatever may be hidden is of no interest to us. The name philosophy might be given to what is possible before all new discoveries and inventions. Hear that before as pre-empirical, as going to be the foundations for looking at careful conceptualization and being concerned about conceptual confusions and the Procrustean bed of a root metaphor of a philosophical commitment to a particular worldview that restricts the ability to make full use of language and uh, our experience. The next, 127. The work of the philosopher consists in marshalling recollections for a particular purpose. It's precisely what the maxims are about in descriptive. 128. If someone were to advance theses in philosophy, it would never be possible to debate them because everyone would agree to them. You see this, of course, in the tautological structure of the maxims. And then this one, I think, is especially interesting, which is where we see the actual power of the kind of work that I think our community in, has been engaged in for a very long time. 129, the aspects of things that are most important for us are hidden because of their simplicity and familiarity. One is unable to notice something because it is always before one's eyes. The real foundations of their inquiry do not strike people at all, unless that fact has at some point struck them. And this means we fail to be struck by what one scene is most striking and most powerful. 
And I think that uh, is in some ways what descriptive psychology offers. Um, And let me start with Maxim One, but in Wittgenstein's language, well, in his English translation. In the volume published uh, also just after he died, the work that he was doing at Cornell with, uh, with uh, David Pears and others at that point, um, he begins the volume on certainty. He's gonna talk about this question of, of certainty and uh, he begins it, if you do know that here is one hand, we'll grant you all the rest. And then he says, because he's going to refer to an issue in mathematics, when one says that such and such a proposition can't be proved, of course, that does not mean that it can't be derived from other propositions. Any proposition can be derived from other ones, but they may be no more certain than it is itself. But then he goes on to say, and this is the key to Maxim 1. From it seeming to me or to everyone to be so, it doesn't follow that it is so. But what we can ask is whether it makes sense to doubt it. If, for example, someone says, I don't know that there's a hand there, he might be told, look closer. This possibility of satisfying oneself is part of the language game is one of its essential features. So it's the language games that I want to talk about. Uh, I'm playing one, you're playing one. Uh, this is what we do, the language games of verbal behavior. Oh, and something else about methodology. Another important reminder. And here's where we see the pragmatic um, anchor in the person concept and in the work of the descriptive psychologist. 11 in uh, the investigations. Think of the tools in a toolbox. There's a hammer, pliers, a saw, a screwdriver, a rule, a glue pot, glue, nails, and screws. The functions of words are as diverse as the functions of these objects. And in both cases, there are similarities. The next one, 12. It is like looking into the cabin of a locomotive. There are handles there, all looking more or less alike. This stands to reason, since they are all supposed to be handled. But one is the handle of a crank, which can be moved continuously. It regulates the opening of a valve. Another is the handle of a switch, which has only two operations. It is either off or on. A third is the handle of a brake lever. It is harder one pulls on it, the harder the braking. A fourth, the handle of a pump. It has the effect only to so long as it's moved to and fro. All tools modify something. So that's what I was going to talk about. Um, these maxims. But about a month ago, I was sidetracked from the original school of the story. So I hope you'll appreciate how I might try to use some of these, these lessons. Uh, so here goes. The year before I came to see you on bus rides between Duke's East and West Campus, I struggled with Noam Chomsky's uh, 1966 Cartesian Linguistics, a chapter in the history of uh, rationalist thought. I could spend, I had no requirements. I could spend hours, the bus would go from East to West Campus. It's about a two thirds of a mile drive. You could go back and forth all day and you'd meet about everybody you know from one campus to the next. So you'd sit around on the, on the bus and people would gather there and it was a, a good time was usually had by all. Um, 
But I was trying to make sense of Cartesian linguistics for a, a course in personality theory I was taking. And I didn't know what to make of uh, the implications of his universal transformational grammar. I thought it had racist implications. I thought the genetics of it seemed bizarre. Um, it, uh, I didn't know what to where, where to place it in my, except I knew that I somehow I was supposed to understand some of the stuff in order to make sense of what was going to go on in a psycholinguistics course I was going to take. It was a struggle. Now I want to jump ahead. A few weeks back, I was strolling through uh, the Strand Bookstore. It's a wonderful, wonderful place in New York City. Uh, when I picked up uh, Chomsky's 2015, What Kind of Creatures Are We? And starting with the first chapter, What is Language? I experienced a clarity I didn't possess before my immersion in the lessons Osorio taught. So that's what I want to talk about instead. Language and verbal behavior conceptualization and theory, the pre-empirical person concept, and a bit of Chomsky's theory of the empirical nature of human persons. Oh, by the way, I don't agree with the, the theory is correct that Chomsky is going to suggest here. I don't know. And the empirical foundations of it involve um, aspects of linguistics that I'm just not in a, I'm not in a position to make uh, good judgments about but it raises issues for us as a community. Again, a little bit of backdrop. A foundational lesson of the pre-empirical person concept, and here I want to underscore pre-empirical, that's a conceptualization, is that it is not an empirically vindicated theory. It's not a theory at all. It's an interdependent, mutually transformable set of concepts. The concepts of an individual person who engage in deliberate action in a dramaturgical pa pattern, fully expressible, fully expressible in some fashion uh, through verbal behavior that reflects the social practices of uh, communities and culture as they go about their live, lives in a world of worlds. That's not a theory. It's a conceptualization of what we mean by persons, a conceptualization that we'll either agree to use or modify or not use at all. But it, it reflects a paradigmatic use of the concept of a person. On the other hand, Chomsky's biolinguistics framework is both a pre empirical formulation of language as an embodiment theory of the potential for linguistic competence subject to empirical challenge. A reminder, I want to separate just briefly conceptualization from theory. And the connection here is pre-empirical to empirical. Conceptualizations identify a subject matter in our case, the principal subject matter of descriptive psychology is the person concept. The empirical identifies instances or instantiations of the subject matter in a real historical world. In our case, human beings and our kin. The job is of theory is to sort out of the full range of a possible subject matter why only particular patterns of instances are found. So if we have a, if a, if a conceptualization, if a paradigmatic conceptualization of persons doesn't apply necessarily to just the human, but to anything that fits that categorization, which is why we can talk about possible persons. We can involve ourselves in debates about the personhood of a fetus. We can involve ourselves with the question of uh, aliens and uh, artificial persons and robots and uh, and some things that I have a deep commitment to, the personhood of, um, of the cetacea, of uh, porpoises, whales, dolphins of sorts, the personhood of some of the other primates, the chimps and the lowland gorillas, perhaps the personhood of certain whales, excuse me, of, of uh, certain birds, as non-paradigmatic representatives of us, or at times maybe as full representatives of us that we just aren't in a position to engage in a proper dialogue with. 
And just to clarify the paradigmatic nature of the concept of person, Osorio's um, somewhat com comment that a zilch particle is a person with almost everything left out, hence the top down to top bottom approach of starting with a full case of complexity, us, and then reducing that case to get at other subject matters. So conceptualizations identify a subject matter. The empirical is, a, is the attempt to identify historical instances that fit the categorization, the, um, the what's been identified as the subject matter. Theory organizes why out of the full range of possibility, only some patterns seem to appear and why it's those patterns and not others. Oh, another dilemma that is particular to our community. And um, in our effort to avoid being or appearing uh, to reify or concretize uh, reduction with reductionistic deterministic explanations, for a variety of reasons, the DP community, but not Osorio, uh, has been uncomfortable and resistant when encountering biological and genetic uh, concepts. Really awkward when we start talking about brain. Uh, and a difficulty that we chronically exhibit uh, is net around, because uh, he's made such a beautiful job of clarifying the use of embodiment language that focus on, we focus on organism embodiment concerns um, that are part of what makes for a paradigmatic human person. We got these, you know, these bodies. And notice I just said human and not just person. So back to Noam Chomsky, he's going to say, he's going to develop his uh, transformational grammar, his deep structure theory. Uh, turns out it's a theory about brain function. It's a genetic theory. It's a theory that um, corresponds to cer a certain uh, evolutionary uh, argument that uh, brain uh, began to show mu mutations that... Uh, somehow or other provided the possibility, provided for linguistic competence uh, that emerged uh, across a variety of terrains somewhere between 50 and 100,000 years ago. But he makes a very, very weird move. And it's the one that leads to the Chomsky-Wittgenstein uh, debate. Wittgenstein was never part of the debate. He, uh, he died in 53. And uh, the Chomsky debate doesn't really start until the late 50s into the 60s. Um, and I'm not going to talk about the ghost in the machine, because although Osorio also thought it was a good idea to read Ryle, um, Chomsky's going to do something weird. He's going to distinguish language from communication, what he calls I language, something that many of us are going to find quite problematic. But it's going to allow, but we're going to be able to make sense of what's at stake when we look at the verbal behavior formula. And I'm not going to worry about the vindication of, of Chomsky's theories. The data about that, even the current data, is, is mixed. Um, uh, but one can say that most about almost all the grand theories and grand narratives. What he provides is a biolinguistics framework. And I'll say something about that. Uh, and again, it might be helpful to remember Ned Kirsch's point that descriptive embodiment, the concept of embodiment, um, provides potential, not deterministic uh, causation. So I'd like us to keep in mind the reasonable empirical claim that an embodied organ of the human body, apparently the brain, apparently as part of a broader system of uh, of organism provides the potential for linguistic competence, a species specific potential vital to our human world and our ways as persons. Okay. So with that, let me 
I, I don't know if what's on is your is the slides up yet? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, I gotta fix them because I just managed to remove them from my screen. Okay. All right. So let me. Uh, I hate it when it looks like this. Let me uh, remind us of the person concept in a broader framework, because what I've added to it um, is culture or community, which if in any careful reading of Osorio and of uh, uh, of the behavior persons, uh, Pete in a kind of dialogue with Anthony Putman points out that it's kind of a um, uh, dealer's choice about how well you can do the carpentry you need to put in culture and personality as something separable enough from language or separable enough. But he's, it's really a, a matter of how well you want to put these things together. Right? It's, it's, uh, uh... One of the points that, that Wittgenstein makes repeatedly is about the irregular terrain of the world and the irregular terrain of language, which is what I try to express through the example of um, the locomotive, the uh, the glue pot, the tool chest, the intensely varied um, uh, manners of operation that can go about doing what language, what verbal behavior can do, which is at the very least can describe the world, um, can evoke memory, can, in, can uh, enjoin, uh, can instruct how to get an experience, um, can identify things. Um, we use we use language in our social practices in, in to get at potentially in one form or another almost everything. So let me just remind us again also that um, what we've created through the person concept is an open set that allows us to insert new concepts or new identifications if we don't already have one that fits. And then the question is whether our transition rules are adequate to allow for, for seamless, for everything to connect together. So we have an individual person as one of the subcomponents who paradigmatically engages in deliberate action in a dramaturgical pattern. We have behavior. And in, in behavior, we mean intentional action, um, which has a set of varieties from cognizant to deliberate to, um, to non-deliberate to unconscious, uh, in which we've got these different kinds of, of parameters that we can use to um, describe the nuances. And if it turns out that there's a nuance uh, that is not already um, clear within the concept of behavior, we can add it. Um, Know-how, for example, didn't uh, show up in Pete's early writings, but um, was a theme that was directly can be found in philosophical writings from Aristotle through Gilbert Ryle, who has a famous chapter in the concept of mind on know-how. Osorio mm -hmm. began to recognize that, inserted know-how as one of the parameters. Language, and here's what I'm, which I'm going to be focusing mostly on, concepts, locutions, and behavior. The world the elements of the world, objects, processes, events, states of affair, states of affairs, concepts and relationships. The facts of the world boil down to various states of affairs, not to certain kinds of positivistic statements or truth tables. That was the central reason that Wittgenstein moved from the Tractatus to the investigation. And then culture, which I'm gonna need to make use of, which has a world with members, we have social practices, statuses, language, and choice principles. So let me hydrate, caffeinate. Important for the organism and for the function of the brain, <laughs> which provides for my uh, ability to stay awake and to, um, well, I don't know about you, but uh, you know, I'll, I'll do what I can here. <laughs> so uh, let me uh, uh, take us through these three 
this is the only other slide, so it, 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 the pain will be over quick. Um, Osorio's pre-empirical verbal behavior formula, verbal behavior being a kind of set, although set theorists don't like these kinds of notations, but set a set of concepts, locutions, and behavior. Um, the C, grammar-linked concepts. Ah, another point from Wittgenstein. Um, get to it a little lower. But what he's going to say grammar does, how it's expressed, and he makes the, I think, a really significant point that the essence of something is expressed in grammar. What our grammatical possibilities do is they allow us to get at the essence, the nuance. And I'll say a little more about that in a bit. So the concepts are grammar-linked concepts, concept speed, uh, actionable distinctions. Um, uh, a difference that can make a difference in behavior. The concepts are something we can have utterances or locutions about that we can perform either phatically through, you know, just gesture and, and, and emphasis, through symbol, through any of the ways that something can be symbolized. And that we have a, we have a, a combinatory um, uh, possibility from a finite number of symbols to create an infinite variety of expressions, all of which can in some fashion show up in some way, what's going to be called, what Pete's going to call a, a locution. But it's verbal behavior. It's behavior as, and by behavior here, we're talking about, we're talking about actual speech acts, linked intentional actions, social practices, the done thing. So that's, that's our piece of background to begin with. We all know this. We were all schooled in this. Another thing from Wittgenstein, which I'll say a little, little bit more about. Wittgenstein has a series of equivalences and interconnections. Now, remember the interconnections that we had in the person concept, the interconnections of um, uh, individual person, behavior, language, world, and culture. These are all interdependent. Each is translatable into every other one. That all of these separate um, uh, uh, distinctions, conceptual distinctions, can be mapped fully into every other one here in some form, which is why they're interdependent. Wittgenstein has a number of places where he talks about this, but this is, I think, in some ways, the clearest one. Uh, and it comes with an interesting um, beginning, which I didn't understand until recently, or I think I understand. 96, and he's talking about the whole dilemma of language, of the world, of thought, which he's separating as a separable category, as will Chomsky, in spite of the fact he's supposed to be having this major argument. Other illusions come from various quarters. We're gonna underscore illusions here thought, language, now appear to us as the unique correlate or picture of the world. And here we go. These concepts, proposition, language, thought, world, stand in line one behind the other, each equivalent to each. And then the key question, but what are these words to be used for now? The language game in which they are to be applied is missing. The language game is missing. And that's verbal behaviors B. Now, what are language games? Um, language games are family resemblance groups. Uh, and let me remind you about just family resemblance groups. He talks about games as, you know, we have some games like, you know, we play throw balls, some we hit with a bat, some we aren't do on a chessboard. Um, uh, that he points is that what makes them, they all have some resemblance. They're the way a member of a family may have a resemblance the way i could say well i you know can't define pornography but i know it when i see it um that there's things that hold them together the same way that the hedonic the prudent uh the aesthetic and the moral ethical um are family resemblance groups there's nothing that specifically holds all of them together as being um of an identical sort 
uh, of being of this exactly same logical type, but they resemble each other significantly enough to see the overlap. And they're akin to one of his most important concepts, forms of life, which I want to say a bit about. Um, forms of life being uh, not um, a biologic concept, but an anthropological concept. And what they refer to are social, intellectual, and aesthetic norms. And um, I'm just going to give us a brief set of descriptions about these. Forms of life turned out, I think, in the readings of most uh, linguistic scholars of Wittgenstein, and um, in summary works of his, uh, one of the key concepts, although he mentions it four times in his investigations. Um, and that's why I'm gonna show the, I mean, just, so, so, so bear with me for a moment. Uh, the first is Maxim 19 in the investigations, where he says, and to imagine a language is to imagine a form of life. The second time he uses it is uh, in the uh, Maxim 23. The word language game is used to emphasize the fact that speaking a language is part of an activity or of a form of life, an activity. And then the, the, the last, well, not the last, it's just one more that I'm not gonna get to because I can't remember it, uh, 241. What is true or false is what human beings say, and it is in their language that human beings agree. This is an agreement not in opinions, but rather in forms of life. The agreements that he's talking about um, is this notion of norms, the sort of social, the aesthetics of social, intellectual, and aesthetic agreements as to how to proceed which show up in the, um, if you will, the, the, the part of the concept of values and social practice. Hey, when, when yeah. uh, it's moderator Reg here, I imagine that you wanna leave uh, some time for- Yeah, I, mean, I just, I've got just one more and then I'll, I'll shut the fuck up and we can go from there. <laughs> no, no. Uh, but I gotta do this next one or, you know, it's just, so- You have about 10 minutes left for so, your your talk your presentation before we would transition i'll do it in six minutes and 35 okay. seconds we're good we're, it sounds like we're good thank you okay <laughs> so what is chomsky's gonna say <laughs> in six minutes and 35 seconds or less <laughs> eight minutes i have no fucking idea but um he has these two theories one he calls i the other he calls e e-language, which, and as theories, they're subject to empirical inquiry, validation, or vindication. His i-language uh, is um, an individual property of, the, of an individual, an individual property of an individual. It's specific, it's a universal biolinguistic substrate, mostly provided by the human brain, a basic property of thought, a deep structure universal within humans that provides a generative transformational potential for the full range of grammar necessary for linguistic competence. It's the verbal behaviors, uh, C-links. It's the linkage, um, which he then goes to a series of uh, neuropsychological and um, uh, um, anatomical uh, moderately confusing and moderately well, you know, wondered about ways in which uh, synaptic uh, uh, informational connections can move through whatever the hell the structure is, you know, beneath the fold. Um, E-language is external communication, uh, verbal behaviors, L, and, so, and, and its social practice. He says he's not very interested in, in communication. He's interested in this substrate that allows thought of a certain kind to occur, which he thinks is a substrate in various forms that exist 
reasonably throughout all the mammals, throughout all the vertebrates, um, throughout all of the, uh, through many of the, you know, invertebrates, that wherever there is some capacity, he's not going to make this point, but he's taking a Darwinian point that, that, that follows from it, that connects to it, that organisms um, in their perceptual engagement with the world develop ways of engaging with that world based on the be ability to manage the information and to behave intentionally. So he sees this as the deep structure that allows for certain kinds of intentional recognitions to occur, for circumstances to be recognized as circumstances to be acted on as an inherent feature of the organism. Side note, this is also the kind of theme that, uh, that Nagel is gonna argue about when he's gonna suggest that there's a whole other substrate of another parameter uh, tied to the material that allows for the possibility of consciousness that can't be simply reduced to the fact of the material. But that's another set of debates. So he's after the notion of consciousness and thought. Now, he's arguing that it's 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 that somehow during this period of, of, of rapid uh, uh, mutation, uh, uh, prior to the Holocene, 50 to 100,000 years ago, which has some mild... Um, uh, uh, paleoanthropological um, data, genetic data to, to, to back it, that there was a transformation that allowed to an explosion of, of language uh, across the, uh, the world. Having that capacity, however, um, uh, specific to our particular primate, to Homo sapien, and to maybe some others, um, e-language, the communications became more of the form that are leading to uh, why you're putting up with me right now. And that's, uh, and to um, quote uh, Wittgenstein near the end, and about the rest, I will remain silent. <laughs> so by the, so the point, just the last point here, what I've been able to do by using um, the verbal behavior formulae, I've been able to show that this ongoing debate, well-known debate among certain, you know, people that between the Wittgensteinian notion, because sorry, when Wittgenstein said no private languages, and Chomsky people say, but there's private language. It's this, you know, universal stuff here that doesn't, and it's there. It's a it's a parametric problem which we often face with in descriptive psychology, which it's referring to different con different aspects of of intentional action, different as different parameters of verbal behavior. Um, so there's no real argument there. There's just the empirical problem of whether Chomsky's um, substrate has uh, has any place in heaven and earth. That's all. Hey, uh, don't ask me any technical questions about Chomsky. I'll get a headache. <laughs> You want to unshare your screen, Ben? Oh, stop share. Okay, let me also open it so I can see this damn thing. So, 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 when just to tailgate on one of your comments, um, we're, we're affectionately happy to put up with you. Thank you for your presentation. Nobody has to. Maybe they don't have to, but you know, I'm, I'm grateful when it happens because I know it's hard work. We have questions. Dr. Dane Littman. No? no. Oh, are you sure you have a So much for Sure, please. Okay. Uh, getting one of my degrees, I had the opportunity to take some extra classes, and I took them in, uh, with a Chomsky specialist at the University of Colorado in the linguistics department. And I have to admit, um, I really enjoyed messing around with transformational grammar. It's like a bit like playing chess. It was tremendous fun. I did not see any real important relationship to, I didn't see how it added anything to what I already understood uh, in descriptive psychology. For me, it stood on its own as entertaining, uh, 
but not in a way that I felt I really needed it to enrich descriptive psychology in any way. So well, I was okay, just one, wasted our time. <laughs> the other is you are in your understanding is right. <laughs> Yeah, oh good. The other is that you are in the Harvard Medical School, and I wonder what your relationship is to people in the school uh, who are very much into neuroscience, which Pete is not particularly interested in, shall we say. I think that's a mistake to believe. I think that there's no, that there's not that Osorio had no interest in embodiment. It's that he was his his major subject. Look, like it or I just will say something else controversial here. Osorio wasn't inherently um, a psychologist. He's an analytic philosopher. His background, his dissertation, his work is 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 mainstream in many ways. Mainstream um, uh, Osgoodian analytic and linguistic philosophy. His thesis advisor, his deep his this work. He, you know, it's, he happens to work as he happened to work as a clinician, and this work is extraordinarily useful. Um, and especially as in the status dynamics approach is to have a full model of persons because most of our damn personality theories that have driven psychotherapeutic processes involve limited root metaphors. That was actually my first conversation with Pete, which was having read World Hypothesis, Stephen Pepper's work. I was concerned about the limiting metaphors that grab, that created uh, the personality theories. And he said, yes, that's why we need something that doesn't that isn't restricted to a particular generative concept except for the top-down concept, rather than a root that generates the subject matter. Let's start with what we take human, what we take the person to be, which is a deliberate actor that makes choices and all of the things that are involved in that kind of quality. Um, uh, embody, it just so happens that we're, that our choices are often made given the fact that we're a particular organism with, you know, I mean, I'm not a psychoanalyst having deeply read Freud for nothing. Um, uh, there's stuff that we do that does seem to be something to do with the fact that we're mammals and primates and monkeys and, you know, that also turn out to be persons. We have a question from um, Greg Colvin. Greg? Yeah, hi, Wayne. Um, since you got to the end of the Tractatus, it's always worth remembering the sentence that goes, um, how the world is, is not the mystic. That the world is, is the mystic. Yeah, there's and, a tradition in which looking at that is essentially a, a doctrine of, of mysticism. Um, all that is the case. Martin? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for Martin. this interesting talk, Gwen. Um, uh, I just wanted to uh, uh, hear whether you could, in a minute or so, explain why the controversy between Chomskyans and Wittgensteinians about the private language argument is a non-starter, a non-debate. Well, because the uh, debate usually boils down to simply looking at his concept of I language and what he doesn't think of as, I think in some ways, because he calls the damn thing language. Um, mm -hmm. And um, uh, you know the 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 concept of 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 verbal behavior. Wittgenstein is working with a verbal behavior concept, not with the same concept that 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 Chomsky is concerned with. He makes it very explicit in in uh, his last set of lectures that um, he doesn't really care that much about communication. Uh, what he cares about is this um, potential structure, his theorized structure. That allows for a certain kind of tra of, of a kind of um, way to connect every possible recognition with every other possible recognition, and then to spell out the transformational uh, possibilities of unfolding those things into an infinite variety of ex of, of uh, understandings. He's trying to deal with the Darwinian uh, point of um, uh, how a, a limited set of sounds and and, and images could generate uh, a, a, a wide variety, a very a very large variety of, of actions. He transforms it into an infinite variety, and that's what the, the, the notion of the grammar is about. Um, when Wittgenstein says essence is expressed by grammar, he's making a similar kind of point. Um, uh, 
So I think in some ways the debate is um, is is uh, what we have here is a failure to communicate that um, mm -hmm. uh, that that uh, Wittgenstein is talking about the full verbal behavior formula. Um, Chomsky is only interested in an unfolding of the C uh, in terms of, of the grammars that would link together concepts as distinctions that the organism is able to act on and um, store some memorable recognition of to act on it again and to combine it with other recognitions. The vocabulary, so to speak, I think. I may have that last yeah. part. Greg has another mm -hmm. question. Um, yeah. Greg, we're back to you. <clears throat> Unmute, please. Greg, unmute. Unmute. Um, I don't know how far off in the weeds he is, but it sounds um, much, much more like he's looking for a theory of competence. Um, that we have to have the capacity, the competence uh, biologically to engage in what we engage in, or we wouldn't we wouldn't be speaking language. And it wouldn't be surprising that across humans, it would be a similar set of competence and that it would be different than a chat, a chat, uh, whatever we're calling those damn things. Um, yeah, you know, you're, you're right. In fact, but that's precisely what he says. He uses that term. He points out... Um, I got I you know somewhere in my notes here um, uh, that his the, what he's doing is that uh, is that he's specifically saying that what he's talking about is not actually competence but it's something prior to competence it's something that allows a competence to develop it's the foundations of linguistic competence uh, it's a substrate that allows for, but it it's a competence theory it's not a theory of uh, it's not. It's not so much about K or W, it's about KH as, um, uh, so yeah, that but he's, he's quite explicit about that. Um, then where, where is he going wrong? That Well, we're going wrong maybe that, uh, you know, his, the particulars of, of, uh, of what he thinks these transformational rules are, um, the, 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 the specifics, um, is where he may be going wrong, which he acknowledges. He's there and it's, He's pointed out in his last set of writings, um, and this goes through all through his to his political work, all through this the corpus of things that he does. This interconnection between, um, uh, if you will, expanded behavior potential. The guy, you know, ends up in a position of um, what he calls what does he call it? He calls it uh, um, uh, libertarian socialism. That. Um, of the sort of odd level playing field of of the of a possibilities for human expansion, um, uh, there's but you know he he's, he has a particular set of models of what that have to do with theories of of connectivity between ideas, um, not so dissimilar to Freud's notions of ideas being able to be connected by purposes of of similarity of affect similarity of I of you know associate the, the full range of associations he thinks has um, a certain kind of identifiable neurological substrate. Um, but to identify that substrate itself as the way it works, you know, it's, it's beyond my competence. Um, uh, so it's, 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 a, it's a theory. Uh, I don't know that he goes wrong. I just don't know that he goes right empirically. But the idea of it being a way of, to think about things, I think is, is, is what's important here is that and I just raising the issue for us in part because we tend to be very dismissive of anything that that we say is has its its grounding in um, in the ground, in the body, in the organ. Uh, God help us if twenty years ago people wanted to talk about neuropsychology in this group. God, I mean, who is we could talk about because Mary Scheidler made that require a requirement. Pete and I had a lot of arguments about it. I didn't yeah. buy. Walter has a question. Let's go to Walter, and this will be our our last question. Lynn, uh, thank you very much. Uh, you made this very user friendly, which I very much appreciated. Uh, just a couple of uh, small comments. One is, uh, for someone, uh, or rather, given that Pete was interested in artificial intelligence, um, he certainly must have been very. Uh, keenly interested, uh, tuned into matters of embodiment, 
you know, I, I mean, I just wanted to, to say that, but, but it's true. I've, I've long um, experienced a discomfort um, and I've experienced discomfort about descriptive psychology's um, strained relationship with uh, embodiment. Then the other comment I wanted to make was, um, I found that uh, Wittgenstein's locution, forms of life to be not very satisfying. And I wondered if it could benefit from a, a parametric analysis or something along that line, or if, or if he does that informally. No, I think it, it, he does it. He only mentions it four times. And that um, it becomes one of that's why um, the, the person who's probably done the best work on it um, is a Hacker, uh, where he points out that it's essentially an anthropological concept that is to be you know, connected to quite directly to social practices. So the way to um, unpack that is to look at the parameters of social practices, to look at the person concept, broadly speaking, in terms of its place in, in action representation. And I just got far enough in the weeds of my own thoughts that I don't even remember what the question was. So, you know. No, it, it was direct. Uh -huh. It has been pointed out also that the direct translation from German would be way of living, if that uh, ah. makes any difference. I, 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 that, that does to me, because what I was thinking is that um, ways of life. that way, the ways of the personal way of life formulation that I've I've toyed with, but I've never written up. Uh, is was something something that could lend itself to it potentially. Yeah, Hacker and Schulte in, in the more recent translations make make you know make that a bit clear, but they still they still like to talk about forms of life as in some mm -hmm. fashion um, what feels like a more authentic way in terms of his his way of talking. But the life that he's talking about is the ways of life. Um, not it's not a biologic. He's not talking. Mm -hmm. about, you know, he, he's talking about. Uh, um, again, as Hacker points out in his text, it's it's an anthropological rather than physiological. Uh, all right. That's all. Okay, this concludes this uh, session. Um, way good to see you on the screen. Wish you were here in person. Me too. Thank you for sharing your um, expertise and for the discussion. Um, we'll reconvene at. 11.20.